today by my colleague, Victoria Gonzalez. And uh, Victoria is our uh, Director of Engagement, uh, both in schools and in the communities. So she's kind of responsible for our eyes and ears in all the communities and how we're doing. And also very heavily involved in all of our international uh, kind of uh, uh, expansion. So uh, we called this one very cleverly, we thought. Uh, mind up where the you know where the positive education and mindfulness you know meets the chalkboard and basically what I'd like to share with you today is a little bit about what we've done at the Han Foundation with our mind up program a little tiny bit about who we are what we've done what we've learned over 13 years and then I want to give you like four things that you can go back that if you did any one of those things it would fundamentally change the nature of your classroom if you're a teacher, or it would change the nature of your engagements with your students, if you're a counselor, or you're a therapist, or you know any of the things that you're, you're working with. So my name is Lori Coots. I'm the CEO of the Han Foundation. We have been around for about 13 years. It was a foundation that was started by Goldie Hahn shortly after 9-11. Now, you may know Goldie from, you know, her after stays, overboard, Private Benjamin, all that stuff, and you may think, what in the hell does she have to do with SEL? Well, after 9-11, Goldie began to notice that there was a condition in the United States that was creating this hypervigilance amongst adults, and that that hypervigilance was creating a lot of pressure with kids. At the same time, in the United States, we're having all of this educational reform energy, so there's a lot of new initiatives that are coming in, and teachers are getting more and more stressed as they've got more and more things to do. And at about the same time, we were starting to notice that kids we're starting to feel incredibly pressurized and having the ability to not focus well in school. And we were starting to see the levels of poverty and the levels of, of, of bullying and violence and that sort of stuff increase in the school. The thing that really pushed her over the edge was when she realized that suicide is the number two cause of death amongst children 12 to 24 year olds. How did that happen? How did that happen in a country as well-educated, as rich as the United States. It happened because in our whirlwind world, we have started to forget about the humanity of dealing with each other as human beings. It's something that's not taught in the home as much as it should be, not because people don't want to, but in many cases because their people aren't there, the parents aren't there. Many kids have just a guardian or in the foster care system. Those that do have two, two parents often have two parents that are working multiple jobs. We live in a very, very high pressurized world that is very performance dominated and we've kind of given short shrift to what it means to take a minute to actually see another human being to register what they're feeling and what's going on. So what she created, she brought all these experts together. She brought you know, uh, experts in neuroscience and positive psychology, and she brought them into a room. And as only Goldie Hawn can do, she put her hands on her hips, and she said, what are we going to do about this? And she created a program that is scientifically oriented, that is you know, evidence-based, we've been researched for 13 years, we have, you know, oodles and oodles and oodles of research papers ab ab about the program, and we're now, of course, CASEL approved. It's a framework and a curriculum that I'll tell you all about that provides SEL skills. And the way we do that is that we bring it to schools through teachers, because teachers are actually where it's at. <laughs> You know, you could try to teach it directly to the kids, but it wouldn't make any difference because this is something that has to be modeled. And so I'm going to tell you right now, we are not for everybody. If you're a principal who wants something that's a curriculum in which you just want to cross the T's and dot the I's, pick somebody else. That's not what we're interested in. We're interested in bringing a curriculum and a framework to your school that will positively change your school climate, your learning climate, your citizenship of your students, your engagement of your parents with your students' education. That's what we're interested in. I'll tell you a little bit more about how we do that. We work via either a whole school or a whole district. We also teach individual teachers at regional trainings because 
here's what I came up with. Um, when I first joined the organization, they said, oh, we only do whole school implementations. And I agree, a whole school implementation is a great thing. It's a beautiful thing. When you can get a principal to say, I'm going to change the culture of my school, I love that. But you know what? I can tell you four or five teachers throughout the course of my life that fundamentally changed my life. So to dismiss an individual teacher as unimportant was not something I was willing to sign up with. So we now offer regional training. So we are new to Hawaii. We have been doing, uh, we've done six trainings so far in Hawaii from Pearl Ridge to Kula. We are across all of the islands. We're going to be doing a regional training in January. So we're new to Hawaii. We're just getting introduced to Hawaii and we're very, very excited about the opportunity here because I keep hearing people talking about understanding the value of social and emotional learning. And I think when you have an educational environment in which people are saying, hey, we think this is going to be valuable, a lot of magnificent things can happen. Our model is based on providing a lot of digital support, whether it's through a digital portal or through the various different apps. But really, we have an in-person training that's quite remarkable. And I always say to my trainers that you have to start with the teachers in the room, right? You can't come in and say, oh, I'm going to do this great stuff for your kids. You have to say, I get it. You've got plenty of things to do. You are marking the time between now and when you can go grade papers. I get it. But I want to take some of your stress and teach you how to mitigate that. I want to teach you how to do that differently. So we start by teaching the teachers the skills. And we work across a wide spectrum of implementations. We are grounded in neuroscience. We are activated by mindful awareness. We are inspired by positive psychology. And we are a catalyst for social emotional learning. Social emotional learning is, is the big prize at the end of it, right? Like whether you call it emotional intelligence, whether you call it social emotional learning, you want to get to that space where you give that child the pause button between what's happening to them and how they're responding. Our curriculum and framework is broken down into 15 lessons across those four core things. So, in neuroscience, we teach about the brain. We move all the way around through mindful awareness and all the senses. We move into some very specific skills in, in positive psychology. And in the social emotional learning sphere, we work a lot with those pro-social behaviors that actually change the environment of how kids are learning. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. We implement through a school year. So let's just say that this is an independent school. We do a teacher training. And in the evenings or the mornings, depending on whether it's a community that has a lot of shift work or not, we will do a parent training. And what we, the feedback we get from our parent training is like, I'm glad my kid's getting this, but I need this. I need, I need to learn how to like put my phone down and to have a conversation. I learned that need to learn how to have these conversations. I need to learn not to be so stressed out. So we start with an introduction to the teachers and the, we, the parents. Then we implement our lessons as we start to go through. We have check-in times. We have webinars. We come back at the middle of the year and do kind of a booster training. And we're available at any time from a relationship standpoint to be able to be there for that school. Some schools have different, different issues. We deal with Catholic schools. We deal with Jewish Orthodox schools. We deal with schools that are very into Common Core, schools that are completely driven by an arts integration program. So you can imagine that this is a very malleable framework. And to be perfectly honest, while the curriculum is important and sequential and provides scaffolding of lessons, it's the framework that's more important. Okay? This is not something else for a teacher to do. This is a way of teaching. This is a way of being. So how do we do it? Let's start with practice number one. Practice number one is changing the way your kids come into a classroom. Let's say you're a teacher. I call this mindful morning. The lights are dim. You may have soft music playing. 
You may have them line up outside of the classroom and you may have them enter one at a time. That's so that you can actually look them right in the eye and say good morning and take in their demeanor, understand their body language. You can, you can tell from somebody's body language whether they've just rushed to school without breakfast, you know, whether they're already in trouble, whether they've navigated something that they're kind of disheveled, if they had trouble on the way to school. You'll be able to know and make an immediate assessment of that child. In some cases, this may be the only time that child gets looked straight in the eye and assessed. And that's a sad fact, but it's very, very true. We now are in a situation where 52% of our children are on some sort of subsidized meal plan. Poverty and economic problems have really crept in to the point where that is no longer a minority population. And we have another 50% who have uh, experienced one to two traumatic events. Traumatic events being defined as, I've seen my parent arrested, I've seen somebody shot, somebody in my family's on drugs, you know, the police are regular visitors at my house, uh, I have no, you know, solid parents or any kind of uh, adult supervision in my life. Those are all really challenging things. And to be able to have that one moment a day when a child comes into a room, is greeted by name, looked in the eye by a teacher, somebody they usually respect and, and give enormous power to. It's something they'll resist at first. They won't look you right in the eye. I don't know how many of you have uh, had children that go trick-or-treating. You know, sometimes we do these things where we say, now after you get the treat, you need to look at them and say thank you. You know, and your kids won't do it. For years they won't do it, right? But children will learn and they will learn to appreciate it, and especially when you start to connect, follow up that might be put. So make eye contact, contact greet the students mindfully, and, and, and kind of bring them into the room by name. And then we normally take what's called our first brain break. Now, Goldie was really smart about this. She didn't call it meditation 13 years ago when she opened up this, this whole program, right? Because she knew nobody would buy into that. They would think it was some woo-woo voodoo thing that you know, came from Buddhism. This is actually something that's very grounded in neuroscience and will fundamentally change the children's minds to learn. So as we start our program, we start our program by first teaching the kids about their brain. And this is the second jewel, that if you take this one thing away, this can fundamentally change everything. You have not lived till you've seen what happens, like the light bulb that goes on over a kid's head. As soon as they learn how their brain influences what they think, how they feel, and how they behave. When they start to put that all together, that's something that really is exhilarating for them. And the wonderful thing is, if you're 6, 7, 12, 14, you may feel like there is tons of stuff you have no control over. But when you learn to control yourself, that is a very, very powerful thing. You may choose from time to time to not control yourself. And that's control too. But once you know, you can't unknow it. So it's not like we get into deep, deep neuroscience, right? We start with three basic operating factors inside the brain. The amygdala, the hippocampus, and the prefrontal cortex. So most of our kids call it the PFC. We explain that the PFC should be making the decisions, you know, it should be thinking things through, it should be rational, it should be making good decisions about what you're going to eat, what time you're going to go to bed, what you're going to choose. We explain to them that the hippocampus is where all the memories live. And so we start to talk about how the hippocampus remembers things. And when something happens to us and we experience it, the hippocampus reminds us of that. And then we explain to them about the amygdala. That the amygdala can hijack everything. That the amygdala has this secret power to completely shut off all reason 
anything else and to be able to make us do incredible things. So who here as a grown-up hasn't been trying to go to bed the night before an important meeting and our brain just will not shut up. It's louder than ever. You've got all these voices, all these conversations, things you would have done. Things. That is our amygdala in modern times doing what it used to do to keep us alive. So in the olden days, rustle in the bushes. You don't want to go through the whole thing about the hippocampus remembering well. Two times it was a saber-toothed tiger. One time it was just a bird. You know, it may or may not be a threat. No, your amygdala kicked in, you ran, you lived. That was the natural selection process. That caveman part of our brain is still there in a world in which most of our fight or flight situations are completely self-inflicted. Now, when you exercise that amygdala's response all the time, because you do live in a highly stressful environment, if you're a child who has parents who fight all night long or who has to navigate incredible instances to get to and from school or incredible bullying when he gets home, that's a child that has a very short distance to his amygdala being lit up at full range. And that means that child has very few choices about how he's going to respond. But we can teach them to do differently. And you haven't lived till you've heard a three-year-old tell you that she has to go sit on the carpet because her amygdala is about to act up. <laughs> little, little children can learn the concepts of this very, very easily. So first, we teach the kids about their brain. And when we get to the adolescent level, when we teach the adolescents about their adolescent brain, first and foremost, the teachers are flabbergasted because the teachers just thought these kids were, you know, assholes. And when they understand the physiology of what's going on inside the adolescent brain, they get a whole new respect for the torture that these kids are going through. And to explain to the kids why they are not likely to make a good decision in a bad situation. Because at that moment in their life, their prefrontal cortex is the size of a pea. And their amygdala is like going crazy and, you know, basking. So it's a very important thing to be able to help children understand their brain. They are going to have this brain with them the rest of their lives, and it's really important for them to be able to decode their, their, uh, their behavior and how they're working out. So what I'd like you to do is kind of sit up in your most, as John Kabat-Zinn would say, your most dignified position in your chair. Uncross your legs. Untangle yourself. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to have you experience one kind of brain break. Now, brain breaks can be guided imagery. They can be focused meditation where you're focusing on listening for something in particular. I like to use bird song in many cases to get people to think about how many birds they're hearing. What we're going to do today is we're just going to experience a very quiet meditation that is going to be all about focusing on your breath. Now, if you've ever done like yoga, in the very beginning, when you first learn yoga, they say, focus on the breath. And you're going, I have no idea what they mean by that. What I mean is you're going to breathe deep and slow, and you're going to exhale deep and slow. And after you do that two or three times, your brain's going to go off. You're going to start making grocery lists and doing other things. And then you're going to go, oh, 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 breathe in, breathe out. Don't try to trap your brain. Your brain's going to be your brain. Let it be your brain. It thinks. That's what it does. It goes all the time. So you're just going to focus on the breath. Now I'm going to trigger this with the chime. And I want you to listen to the chime for as long as you can. When little kids first learn this, they can hear the chime for about maybe a minute. By the time they've been doing this for a year, they can hear that chime for four and a half minutes. The ability to listen and focus becomes more clear and more dense. So 
You may either close your eyes or look down at your lap. The reason why we encourage you to look at your lap when you're not going to close your eyes is mostly because other people are self-conscious about you maybe staring at them when their eyes are closed. Okay? So, take a deep breath, sit in your most dignified position, and listen for as long as you can. And as you start to hear less and less of the chime, I want you to just focus on your breath. Breathing in all the way down to your belly. And breathing out. And as thoughts start to enter your brain, just notice them, and again, take a breath. As you start to notice sounds in the room, just notice them. Let them go. Take a breath. Now I'm going to ring the chime again. I want you to listen as long as you can. And when you are done hearing the chime, just open your eyes and come back into the room. How long do you think that was? This is the audience participation part. Two minutes. Two minutes. So when we start this with children at the beginning of the school year, we start with a minute. You know, it's very hard for children to sit still. We do it first thing. We recommend that they do, teachers do it first thing in the morning, after lunch, before they go home from school, and before any testing. We found, we've got some field research that's going in right now, but anecdotally we found that it really reduced anxiety and testing. In uh, one school in Marysville, they actually have a testing room where the big testing happens. And so the kids walk mindfully to the testing room. They do a brain break right before. They sit down. They do the test. They do a brain break afterwards, like a cleanse, you know, and then they leave. And, and, and the anxiety has been reduced, and the level of kind of worry about testing has really gone down. So this is the third thing. The first thing I told you about was the mindful greeting in the morning. The second thing I told you about was the way you can engage your kids from a standpoint of understanding their brain. And the third thing is the brain break. Now, 
like I said, you can do these guided meditations. You can do, you know, focusing tension and release. Uh, with the older kids, we tend to do a little bit more um, uh, stress-oriented uh, things where they're really using body parts as surrogates for their overall tensions. Um, there are many, many, many different ways of doing this. Some teachers like to do um, uh, music in the background. Some like it quiet. Like I said, there are you know, many ways. And in our instructions, and in our lesson plans, we tend to kind of try to explain to people six or seven ways in the training so you get a chance to experience it. Because not every kid is going to be the same. So my brain breaks are a great way to quiet the mind and prepare it to learn. So as kids have rushed to school, maybe eaten breakfast, maybe not, maybe navigated a lot of things, maybe not, they will get to a classroom, be mindfully greeted by a teacher, brought into the room, do a two to three minute brain break, and then school begins. Everybody's ready. You help the kids understand how that movement is making their brains ready to learn, and you begin. So already, just by doing a couple little things, you have changed the nature of your relationship with the kids. Then what you might want to do is you might want to think about how to expand their awareness of their senses. Because we live in a very, very fast-paced world. We tend to not pay attention to what we're putting in our mouths before we put it in our mouths. We tend to not really listen to what's going on or we have headphones. Um, to, to, to hear what we want to hear. And the sad, sad fact of that is um, it was a really scary statistic. About 43% of 13-year-olds in you know, this one section of, of Texas that they did for research had lost already 50% of their hearing in their ears. Now, that's never going to come back. That's not something that heals. And a lot of this is from the overuse of the earbuds you know, inside inside the thing. So mindful awareness. We teach kids to be more mindful of their senses. And it always starts by saying, well, do you know how to be mindful? And they say, no. You say, do you know how to be mindless? And they say, oh, yeah, I know that. So you just kind of work into it. So smelling, tasting, learning how to actually enjoy food, spices, inter interesting you know, things that are a take on that. Hearing, mindful listening, um, helping them understand the sense of touch in a way that they might not have understood before. So we increase the, the, the parts of their senses. Then we do a little bit more on positive psychology. And the, the big kind of linchpins in the positive psychology uh, curriculum here is we want them to learn how to take alternative perspectives. So, Let's just imagine you're a teacher, and let's say you're teaching young children, so it's story time, and this is how easy perspective taking can work into your classroom. So let's say you're teaching kindergartners, and you're reading a story of the three little pigs. And as you're reading the story of the three little pigs, you stop a couple of times, and you start asking the kids to tell you how do you think that pig is feeling right now? And what do you think the wolf is thinking right now? And why do you think the wolf thinks this blowing the house down thing is going to solve anybody's problems, right? Children, until they're you know, second, third grade, they don't really, really think other people have different perspectives than that. They kind of think everybody thinks the same way they do. This is about the time, second, third grade, they start to get shocked that their friends might have a different opinion than them. And so being able to have a curriculum that encourages different perspectives, or let's take a look at this and flip it upside down. What if the pigs all got together and blew, there's three of them, and blew the wolf away? You know, how do you think the wolf would feel? Would that solve the problem? You know, being able to have that kind of interrogation on a simple story will help to seed perspective taking. By the time we get to high school, we're showing Kurosawa's film of the car accident and the multiple perspectives of the eyewitnesses and starting to ascertain 
what that has as an impact in the judicial system and how that affects everything. The fact that you have such wonderful things in the Hawaii school system that keep people integrated into Hawaiian culture gives you a lot to work with from a standpoint of modern day and cultural bearings. So perspective taking is really important. The other thing we teach is optimism because, and this may come as a surprise to some of you, you are not born optimistic. This is not like blue eyes or brown eyes. Optimism is something you learn. It's like learning to play an instrument. It is a daily choice. In some cases, a moment to moment choice. I have been living the past two years through a massive renovation of an 1866 brownstone while I'm living there. Optimism is a moment by moment choice in my life right now. When I'm covered with dust, when I've got piles of stuff around me, when people are banging, when the doors are open, when I'm exposed to weather, being optimistic is really, really hard. And choosing to be optimistic, choosing what inside every situation I can be optimistic about is really, really something. It's a muscle. It's like going to the gym and building that muscle. Every time you teach ch children to choose a more optimistic perspective, to choose what is true, what is not true, and how to be more optimistic. Is there another way of looking at this? This is a muscle that can help them build their personal resilience because they're not ever gonna have a life in which they don't get knocked down. You wanna make sure that when they get knocked down, they can get back up and that they can have something to show for it. There's another piece of positive psychology called savoring happy memories. And savoring happy memories is an exercise where you help children identify a happy moment in their life and you build an extraordinary depth around it. So you say to children, you start with children and you say, I want you to think of a happy memory and I want you to share it with a partner. And they share and they share and they share back and forth. And then you say, now I want you to think about what were you wearing? What was the temperature like? Was it cold? Were you chilled? Was it hot? Were you sweating? What was it like? What were you smelling? And you start adding layer upon layer upon layer on that memory. Every time you recall that memory back and add a layer on, it gets richer and the path to it becomes shorter. So when you have children who only have one or two happy memories, being able to teach them this exercise as a way of being able to self-soothe We've had children tell us, every time my parents are fighting, I go to my room, I take a little brain break, and I start savoring my happy memory. And in a few minutes, I can kind of ignore the noise that's going on. I can kind of focus on doing my homework. I can make a different choice. Savoring happy memories is, again, like building a physical muscle. So, Perspective taking, savoring happy memories, and choosing op optimism. So we're just going to do a quick little experiment here with savoring happy memories. So grab a partner. I don't care if it's somebody you came with or somebody you've never met before. Just grab somebody right next to you. And we're going to go partner A and partner B. So d grab a partner. This is the participation part. Don't worry. You'll all come, it'll all come back to you. You'll be cynical again when you leave. It's OK. Okay, partner A, raise your hand. Okay, partner A, take one minute to tell partner B your happy memory. Okay. Okay, and wrap that up. And partner B, tell partner A your happy memory. Close your eyes, think of your happy memory, and I want you to start adding some layers of texture. 
So what were you wearing? Do you even remember the time of year or the date? Were you alone? Were there other people around? Were you eating something special? Were there smells that you recall? Think about what you were doing physically. Did you have your shoes on or did you have your shoes off? Think about all that texture. Were you at home or were you somewhere else? Were you in familiar territory or not? Were you surrounded by loved ones or were you all by yourself? Okay, now partner A, I want you to tell that same story, that same happy memory with all this texture to partner B. Ready, go. Your turn. Tell that story with all that richness. Hey. So, what happened? What'd you notice? Come on, this is audience participation. You gotta notice something. Yeah. The smiles. If you could have been in my shoes looking at the room, all of a sudden everybody's smiling. As we start to add more texture, there was more laughing. Did you notice how the decibel level of the volume went up in the room? You were talking louder about your, your experience. Great observation. Great observation. What else? Anybody notice anything specific about your exchange? Yeah. I was like a little emotional. It was really happy. Yeah. And then it kind of hit us of, well, that time things are so different now. Yeah. Um, yeah. Nostalgia. Exactly. Yeah. And that is the difference, one of the primary differences between kids and adults. Kids don't have the flashback or the comparative. Adults kind of start, you, you're right there emotionally. And then, then intellectually, you start to go, well, I wonder if it'll ever be that good again. You know, I wonder if it'll ever be, you know. And, and like, you know, it can get kind of crappy. I mean, you know, it can, it can get kind of emotional. You can get a sense of loss, you know, if you're not careful. When that happens, you want to go back to what made it happy. You know, so you want to, you want to notice that you're actually comparing that moment. You're no longer in that moment. You're in some other comparative moment. And, you know, that sounds really easy. That's hard to do. That's hard work, right? To be in this moment right now instead of either waiting for a better moment that's going to happen sometime in the future or, you know, dwelling on a moment that was past that you should have made better use of. That's hard work. That's really, really hard work. And so what we want to do is kind of really just kind of gravitate back. Like, you know, I used to carry a rubber band on my wrist because I was really bad. I was like a type A overachieving executive that was like a workaholic and had no emotional intelligence whatsoever. And I used to, you know, snap myself with a rubber band when I was being ridiculous, you know, because people would start to look at me like, what planet are you from, you know? Um, and I had to kind of learn some new skills, yeah. You had... You couldn't even find a happy moment, no, right? I, mean, I, really taking, I didn't want to waste the yeah, time. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Go. And so the first thing, of course, is I work with fourth and fifth graders with developing emotional intelligence. And I, I know, you know, when you engage in this, there's always also that issue of, you know, a parent has passed away. And yep. we're talking yep. about the traumas that our students are yep. experiencing. And sometimes it will trigger an emotional response, especially if West ends up talking about how fabulous they celebrated his father's, seven, you know, and mine yeah. passed away. So, I've seen that. Yeah. I've also seen it build emotional resiliency as a result when you see the power of yeah. people supporting each other and yeah. processing that. But it happens and it's real and it happens to our kids very young. Yeah. Like you're saying, some you know kids don't have that experience, but some of them are old souls and they do. Yeah. And it's very alive for them. Yeah. I'm wondering what your program perspective is. I know I've taken time out of recess or whatever to right. help a student process, even though I'm not a counselor. Right. But, you know, what's your suggestion for bringing it back into that moment of 
How do we move forward yeah. into that positive? So it, it's a really important point that she makes, right? There will be times where you will have somebody who has a trauma that they get stuck on, that they can't get out of. And that's real. That is totally real. And what you want to do is you want to help them understand that there are other people there hearing them. So if they share it with you, or they share it with a partner, or they share it with the class, this is a great learning moment to be able to say, yes, but you had this happy moment, and now you're sad, and we all hear that you're sad, and we all you know, are here to support you. Being able to create empathy and compassion amongst the rest of the class and being able to celebrate that child for being brave enough to share that. Because in many cases, um, I don't know if you guys have found this true, but uh, particularly I noticed in our implementation in Baltimore, um, they have an enormous amount of resources to help these kids from a social uh, services standpoint, from a mental health standpoint. But these kids are very well trained from the time they're three or four that we do not talk about this to anybody else. So to be able to get to the point where you have an experience with the class um, where the child finally feels like he can talk about it, you have to make sure that that is handled in such a safe way, in such a way that that child feels protected and secure and all of that. And, and it, can be, it can be challenging. But I like to turn it into a compassion exercise for the rest of the class. Wasn't it brave? that Michael felt you know, that he could tell us that, that in the midst of looking for his happy memory, he stumbled upon something that wasn't quite so bright and shiny, and that he felt it was OK to tell the rest of the class about that, or to tell his teacher about that, and to start to build a connection. Because then he knows you've seen through another layer of him, right? So you're now two degrees of separation, right? You've got, you've got a little bit more closeness. And if you can ever get a child to go from it just being you to it being you and some peers and, and, and to let themselves be vulnerable and let that be okay, that's when the magic starts to happen. Because then they start to feel like they have a surrounding peer group that will support them, you know, instead of people who might tease them about a problem or whatever. Now, you know, obviously you have to navigate that with some, you know, this is not, um, this is not super easy stuff sometimes, so, but it is a really good question and a really, really important object. Do we have a question over here? Yeah. Yes. That makes, that makes me happy when I think about that. And yeah. Really support each other. Really good. I don't know if you all heard her, but it's really great when the rest of the class starts, you know, let's say somebody feels brave enough to share and it gets to the rest of the class, for another child to be able to say, that happened to me. And here's, you know, here's what I went through. I, like, I couldn't eat for a week and, you know, it was terrible and I had tantrums and it was awful and my grades went down and whatever. And here's how I dealt with it. And here's how I got to the point where now when I think of her, I think of her and smile, you know, instead of it being a sad time that she's gone. So I think being able to engage the kids in the healing power, because kids by nature are resilient if you don't beat it out of them, you know? But we get so many rules that they have to follow without understanding why they need to follow them or why it's hard for them to follow them that it makes it difficult for them to actually get the social intelligence. We had one. So uh, I'm wondering, in your training of adults, do you kind of help adults? Because there are some adult educators that are actually afraid to have these kinds of discussions yes. because they themselves have the, the wrong emotional yeah. stuff uh, to help them become more confident. That yeah. it's OK, you don't have to be a counselor, as you said. Yeah. How do you process that? And yeah. Exactly, exactly. A lot of teachers, I mean, part of the reason why we developed the curriculum is because teachers were scared, OK? And, and this hysterical thing happens. Elementary school, all the teachers can teach the brain. You get to seventh grade, and they're changing classes. All of a sudden, the seventh grade teachers say, I can't teach the brain. Science has got to teach the brain. You know, like it's, it goes in, moves into a divided world, um, which I just, I'm going to do research on that one day. Um, anyway. but. 
the, the reason we did the 15 lessons was, and each one has activities, two types of activities. Activities you do with the whole class that are kind of general to the concept, and what we call extension activities that are language arts, math, art, et cetera, so that you can do it through a particular uh, uh, subject matter. And they're all age appropriate, and the teacher gets to decide. So there will be a bunch of activities for five to seven-year-olds, and you can dial up or down depending on whether you have a really mature class or you have a little naive class, and you can decide which things kind of work better. And then what we do is we pull you as teachers, well, what were your ideas? And then we get your ideas back, and those become more subject matter that are shared with other teachers, right? So we do kind of an irrigation thing, because some of the best ideas in the world, like I don't know how many of you have heard of the glitter uh, you know, when you put the glitter in the, in the, in the, in the, in the water. When I was a, you know, overachieving executive, I had snow globes all over my office, and people thought I was a snow globe collector, and it was just what kept me from committing a homicide, right? Because I would shake these things up and then very carefully watch every particle fall down while I was tediously listening to somebody I could care less about, right? And so, you know, there are various different things that you can have incorporated in your arsenal and different ideas that you're going to come up with. In the end, we want you as a teacher to take a lesson plan that you've probably honed for years to make perfect, and we want you to ask a couple questions of that lesson plan about how you can make it more mindful, more reflective, you know, et cetera, and, and, and own it in a way that feels good to you, right? So the lessons help uh, make it easier for teachers to embrace the concepts but what we always hope is that it becomes a way of teaching, not a thing to teach. Yeah? Okay, so to do that, how do you find the teacher's voices? The teacher's voices we solicit. We have um, a very, very active portal that the teachers are involved in. So they log on to the portal. They'll be able to add directly to the portal in a couple of months. We're building out that functionality right now. So it'll be kind of like Facebook and that you can post and, and do this stuff. Right now, we email them, call them on the phone. We do contests. We give away iPads for you know, ideas and that sort of stuff. And, and basically, we just solicit ideas from anywhere we can. Anybody who's got, you know, particularly a lot of the good adaptations that have come up for special needs have come from those teachers who deal with special needs kids who, who read the lesson, grown up to grown up, and then go, oh, well, I know this thing works with kids that are autistic, so I'm going to try this with autistic children or hearing impaired or educationally impaired or whatever it is. So, you know, the, the con contributions from the teachers are a big, big part of our success. I mean, we wouldn't have half of what we've got if it weren't for the teachers that we've been so fortunate to work with. Yes, yeah, so the, the, the shift that's starting to happen, our, our curriculums in the past have been published by Scholastic. They're still going to be available. But Scholastic was not interested in doing another edition with us. So we decided to do the next edition online. And it'll be out in time for our implementation, she said positively, for, in time for our implementation with Flint, Michigan. We are going to go teach the community of Flint, Michigan, whose poor children have been poisoned with lead you know, how to be more resilient. And we're dealing with the whole community, the medical people, everybody. Um, so the whole thing's going to be online, like an, a learning management system online. So online, you'll be able to see each lesson. You'll be able to see the activities that are very grade and age specific. You'll be able to see all the extended videos that you can either use in your classroom, the, the overheads and the, the, the PowerPoints and the videos that you can show, the animations, et cetera, for the concepts. So everything will be there and it'll all be along. And it goes all the way through high school. Now, the high school curriculum is slightly different. The 15 lessons are rearranged a little differently. In high school, we start with identity. And it kind of starts with, who am I? Who is me? It goes to me to we. How am I in relationships? And that's relationships with peers, family, romantic relate. You know, your brain on romance. When you explain that to a teenager, all of a sudden they start to think about their decisions slightly differently. Your brain on technology. You know, teaching teenagers, you know, how they're going to have an intentional relationship with technology and a variety of different things. And then we move into we, which is what kind of person do you want to be in the world? What kind of stance are you going to take in the world? What is your 
position going to be in community service and pro-social behavior and giving and, and, and that sort of thing. You know, um, kindness, compassion, um, that sort of thing. So, and we do assessments along the way to make it a little bit easier to understand whether or not you're making progress or not. Because a lot of teachers have said to me, I'd be hard pressed to know if my children were more empathetic at the end of the year than at the beginning of the year. So what we do is we try to teach them what increased empathy starts to look like, you know? Because <laughs> it's not a natural thing. When are we what? We're in Flint on election day of all days. Um, you'd be surprised how many schools in the country wanted their training on, how many schools do we have doing election day? We had like 20 schools doing trainings on election day. Because it's a day that schools close, so the polls are open, and it, it's ridiculous. Anyway, um, so we're going to Flint on election day. Yeah. Any other questions? Well, we have uh, handouts. Did we put them up here? So. Underneath three chairs in this room is my business card that will get you a free chime for your classroom. So look under your chairs and see if my business card is there. Yay! We got one here. We got one there. One more. Might have been somebody who left. You might want to check all the chairs in your room. So you can come up and get your chime before you go. Thank you, you guys have been terrific. Thank you very much.